piece. So, um, and then this morning we have uh, one presenter then, and so we'll go for as long as we have questions, and then we'll get into questions with everyone else afterwards. If you have any projects, think about it that you want to announce to everyone or have questions that maybe this room could help you with, we're going to be able to do that. So our first present presentation is from um, Ori Products, and we're getting ready to go. Are you good? I'm good to go as All long right. as I've got the slides. Perfect. I'll take care of it. The clicker's not working, so I will I'll run them for you. I'll just give you a signal. Okay. Perfect. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Good. My name is William Missler. Uh, just call me Bill, and I'm the founder of O-Ring Products LLC, which promotes the expansion and sales of a condom called O-Ring Condom, which is trademarked and patented worldwide. And we're going to start off today with a video kind of demonstrating, explaining what my product is so that when I go into the speech, you'll kind of understand what I'm talking about. Okay, do you want to do the video? Here's something you don't think about every day. Well, <laughs> well let's uh, Congratulate. All right, let's, uh, we have a technical issue here. We'll fix it. Here's something you don't think about every day. Or maybe, in which case, congratulations. Here's something you don't think about every day. Or maybe you do. In which case, congratulations. But for the rest of us, how often have you considered that the general design of condoms hasn't changed all that much in decades? Sure, companies have introduced different marketing gimmicks and catchy slogans. That's obviously the video in the background without the visual, so and more here we go. Can we start it over, the video? <clears throat> Great, okay, here we go. Here's something you don't think about every day, or maybe you do. In which case, congratulations. But for the rest of us, how often have you considered that the general design of condoms hasn't changed all that much in decades? Sure, companies have introduced different marketing gimmicks and catchy slogans, but none of those really did anything to make condoms safer and more effective. And that's a big problem, especially when you consider that there were more than one million sexually transmitted infections, STIs, acquired every day worldwide. When condoms are applied correctly, they're very effective. But when they're applied incorrectly, not so much. And guess what? Studies by the Kinsey Institute at Indiana University show that at least 30% of the time, we're putting on condoms incorrectly. Think upside down or backwards, 30% of the time. And while experts agree that a misapplied condom should be discarded, too often condoms are flipped over and used anyway, increasing the risk of STI transmission and unintended pregnancies. What we need is a way to tell instantly that a condom is being applied correctly. And that's exactly what the O-ring condom does. The O-ring condom has a patented design, a luminescent ring that tells you in seconds the correct way to apply. If the ring is pointing down toward the body, you're good to go. Simple, right? But it solves two major problems. One, it eliminates the frustration and risk of applying a condom incorrectly during a passionate encounter. This is not the time you're in the mood for solving puzzles after all. And two, it ensures the condom is going to perform its job in protecting against STIs and unintended pregnancies. O-ring condoms are FDA approved, have been awarded worldwide patents, and are based on two decades of experience and research in condom design. It's more than just a smarter condom. We believe it's the world's safest condom. Learn more about how the patented Ovary condom design finally solves the greatest cause of condom errors and user frustration. Read the studies and see it for yourself at ovarycondoms.com. Okay, if we could go to the slideshow. Thank you. All right, again, I'm William Missler. We've had a little introduction to the product and we Keep that first slide up, sorry. All right, here we go. Okay, so basically what I'm looking for today is your input. I'm also interested if anybody wants to join my team and obviously I'm looking for, for investors, but let's go into the details. My target market is all condom users and that goes for teenage, 20s, married couples, older users, etc. And as I've said here, there are over 15 billion condoms sold annually, and my initial efforts are to, to hopefully attain about 0.1% market share. The condom market is basically owned by three different companies, Trojan Durex and Lifestyles, which is owned by Ansel, 
and they they own 85 plus percent of the world market as per research. So, um, my revenue stream is based upon sales and, and getting the word out there. Okay, next slide. All right. So let, let me let me give a little bit of a an outline of the presentation today. I'm going to talk a little bit about you know what a condom is and its history. I'm also going to talk about the materials that have been used historically to use uh, to uh, make condoms. Some of the principal problems with condoms and the one I solved, and uh, my patented solution to that problem, which you'll learn is the fumble factor, the FDA approval process, which was long and rigorous, and then the lessons learned and the conclusion. And I'd like you to hold your questions to the end. I'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Let me just get through the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Introduction to condoms. A synthetic rubber latex condom, I'm sure you've, you've seen this uh, before. This is what most condoms look like. And the history of condoms goes back at least 400 years. They have condoms that were recognized in England and also in Sweden. In fact, sheepskin condom was used in Sweden and uh, they came with instructions uh, to clean it with more milk to prevent users from catching STI, uh, STDs, sexually transmitted diseases. And now, of course, the politically correct term or the term that's kind of taken hold in the last decade or two is sexually transmitted infections, same thing. And we know that condoms are used to protect against STIs and unwanted pregnancies, or we could say unintended pregnancies, pregnancies that you don't necessarily want to happen, however you want to uh, phrase that. And condoms are a class two medical device. For those of you uh, who haven't had a lot of uh, understanding of, of uh, medical devices, there's a medical class one, class two, and class three. The big difference is between the class two and the class three is class two, you require animal testing to bring it to market. You require FDA approval, obviously. Uh, but to get that FDA approval, you just need basically animal testing and a bunch of other stuff. The, the big one is class three, where you need, as, as I understand it, human testing. But condoms are a class two medical device. Okay. So the materials used to make condoms, we'll go through, through this briefly. We had chemical, chemically treated linen. We had animal tissue, intestine or bladder of a sheep, for example. And we have in the modern age, the synthetic and natural rubbers, including latex. So the synthetic condoms, as I mentioned in number three above, they include principally polyurethane and polyisoprene, which are two different types of polymers. And of course, there's the natural rubber condom, which comes from the latex of a tree, uh, Javier Brazilianesis. Okay, all right, next slide, please. Now, what is the principal problem with condoms? There have been a lot of problems solved with condoms over the years. One has been the safety issue. Another has been the thickness of the condom and the feel. However, there's been a problem that's plagued the industry for decades, and that is placing the condom on correctly. We've had people come out with, uh, a, a man from South Africa came out with a condom that you had tabs to pull on the tabs, but it was very finicky and, and didn't have any success. And I believe I've solved the problem in a more unique and uh, uh, more simple fashion. So the fumble factor is what's, what they refer to when you talk about the difficulty of placing the condom on correctly. It causes user disruption, feelings of frustration or embarrassment, actual physical discomfort, loss of erection, and of course the increased chance of STIs. Next slide, please. This is a study, and you can find more studies on my website, from the Kinsey Sexual Health Institute at Indiana University in Indiana. This is an excerpt from one of the studies that shows there is a scientific need for this product. So, um, and it shows that 30% of condoms are initially applied inside out. So in other words, you see, you see what it says under the types of condom usage errors, put condom on, wrong side up, had to flip over, and the percentage, uh, you know, 30, 30%. So, and everybody knows that when you put it on incorrectly and then you flip it over, of course it has the pre-ejaculatory semen and that's where the STIs and the unwanted pregnancies occur. So that's why that number is significant. 
And that number is basically the same whether a female is putting it on the male or a male is putting it on himself. And those specific percentages are on the website in some of the studies. We'll talk about that in a while. Next slide, please. Okay, one of the excerpts directly from the United States Food and Drug Administration on how to apply a condom says point blank, unroll or pull the condom all the way to the base of the erect penis. If the condom doesn't unroll easily, it may be on backwards, damaged or too old. Throw it away and start over with a new condom. And of course, that's what most people don't do. They don't, don't follow the directions. So, okay, next slide, please. And this is, we're going into the explanation of the product. This is the solution to the fumble factor. That's my trademarked uh, logo. My website is below. And you're welcome to see this product as a, you know, a sex toy if you like, but it's actually a new medical product that solves a, a very specific problem. So we'll go to the next slide, thank you. So what is the, the definition of over in condom? It's a patented luminescent ring or indicium that's applied on the latex that can be easily seen when the consumer opens the wrapper, indicating quite simply which way to apply the condom so it can be applied correctly in the light or the dark. So what are the main advantages of O-ring condom? Okay, and this is what I want you to listen to right here. It's cost effective, so it's basically the same price as a regular condom that's out there. It has the first significant condom invention in decades. Of course, you know, a lot of people, they come up with different ribbed or different designs and, and they don't really do anything to increase the safety of the condom. But that's what I've come up with, an invention that increases the safety of the condom potentially. And it is, any condom user can easily understand this. In other words, if it's a beginner, a 15 year old or a 17 year old, uh, they can start to use this condom and, and learn how to use it more safely. Whereas if you're 30 or 40 or 50, it still doesn't matter. This is an easier condom to apply even if you're an experienced condom user. And as I've said many times, it has the potential to reduce the transmission of the sexually transmitted infections. And in other words, and how it does that, as I mentioned before, is it eliminates the need to flip over the condom because you put it on correctly on the first attempt. And that, that's the key to understand with this, with this invention. Also, it dramatically reduces user anxiety, and that often accompanies condom application. And the, the, the key summary here is, hey, this is the O-ring uh, condom solution here. It transcends nationalities, cultures, languages, and offers a truly universal medical solution to increase condom safety, acceptability, and efficacy. Next slide, please. Just a brief touch on the United States Food and Drug Administration uh, approval process, extremely rigorous. They required, these are some of the general fundamentals they required. They required some biocompatibility tests they were very involved. I did those at uh, Nelson Labs, which is a laboratory in, in Utah. We talked to, uh, we had to get the minimal uh, essential media uh, lucian test, the uh, ISO mucosal irritation test, and the maximization sensitization test. And also we had to have an acute systemic injection test. I also had to show that O-ring condom used an FDA approved predicate device. And what is a predicate device? That means a device that's already been FDA approved, that my condom uses an approved device. And the goal of the FDA approval was to show that it had equivalence to that device. And that was, that was the, the goal. And also, in the FDA uh, application, I had to show good laboratory practice through Nelson Labs. They had to document all of what they did. As well as that, I had to have very specific labeling and packaging specifications that had to be changed multiple times in order to uh, meet FDA requirements. You'd be surprised at the limited amount of information you're allowed to tell on an FDA approved product. Basically focused just on the medical criteria and safety criteria. And we had to, we had to abide by uh, 21 Code of Federal Regulation, CFR 820. And that showed good manufacturing practice. And that's, of course, at the factory in China where these are made. I had to show that they had good manufacturing practice. The FDA knows that the factory's already approved, but they didn't care. I had to show them that for, for this particular product, they were using good manufacturing practice. And I had to also have uh, post-market surveillance so that when the product got out there, I had to show that it was indeed 
the quality that I claimed it was at the time. So it wasn't just, hey, I'm making this at the factory under high quality conditions. It's, hey, when, it, when a person buys it, is it actually what you're claiming it does from the factory? So it's very thorough. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, a, a quick conclusion. What are condoms used for? They're used for preventing sexually transmitted infections and unwanted pregnancies. I've invented a product that I've trademarked O-ring condom, and I am making the claim that it solves a well-documented medical problem, which has been present in the condom industry for decades. FDA approval was granted, and it requires safety and eff efficacy for approval. And that's the key two words about this condom. It's, I would like you to view it as a new medical product, and in conclusion, Overing Condom offers a truly universal medical solution to increase condom safety, acceptability, and efficacy worldwide. I think that's the last slide. This is my contact information. You can also find it on the website. If you, if you contact us on the website, I'll obviously get the email. Uh, the email. And that's my phone. And, and uh, So this is a package right here of a three pack. And the standard size which is used is the European standard size, which is slightly smaller than the American size. However, we can make it in any size. Currently, we are filling an order for Trinidad and Tobago Health Department, and they requested that the condom be larger, so we are making it larger for them. Of course, all the controls are in place so that the same quality result is there. And that's what the box looks like. I have some samples if you'd like at the very end. But I'd like to open it up uh, for questions now, if, if anybody has any questions. Yeah, go ahead, over in the corner. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, please. No mic today? No mic, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm, I'm OK with that. Um, give me, I'm going to be first online to hand out the samples. But, um, <laughs> All right. So what, what occurs to me here is how much you've obviously spent a lot of time and effort and money getting this approval process. Correct. I prefer not to say, it, it's, that's okay, that's a fair question. I prefer not to say, uh, you can talk to me afterwards and I can give you an idea. It, it hasn't been that expensive, but it hasn't been cheap. Is that a fair answer? No, that's fine. Okay. No, where I'm going with it is, what's, what's jumping out at me is, for you to raise money to go market this, uh -huh. to solve yes. this part of the problem in the marketplace, I don't think you're going to get a lot of people back in it. However, I think because you're, you're akin to like a real estate developer who's already gotten the variances, the clearances, and they already assembled a plot of land that they don't want to go to the bank to get financing to build the product, to build the building and take the development risk. I think at this point, you've got it to a point where somebody can come in and take you out and you know, you'll walk away with a nice chunk of change because you've already done the hard work. So to me, I start to think about this as how you can find a strategic buyer and just okay, thank you, thank you for your input. I'm obviously going to keep that keep that uh, in mind. And, and by the way, this product itself is only one. If you look at the patents on the website and you read them very thoroughly, there's several other inventions that I've come up with that, that address the same problem. And one of them is tactile bumps, which I call tactile bumps. And instead of that fluorescent ring, we actually would apply tactile bumps. And so in other words, you wouldn't have to look at all, you just feel it. And wherever you have those non-irritating tactile bumps, that would be the side down. And of course, that could be used for the blind as well. Thank you for your question and your comments. Yes, sir, in the, in the light blue. Um, so I, I think, just my opinion, so I think that uh, it does solve an issue, but I think that um, there's a lot of people in the public that don't know that this is an issue. They don't understand it's a pain point. So, for me, when I see that, I think that either the approach should be some sort of campaign to help people understand that this is an issue. So it's, it's, that, that's a difficult thing. But another thing might be to, because you do have patents, I wonder if you've looked into some sort of regulation, like through a regulatory agency that would say, hey, this is a safety issue that all you condom people have to adopt something for this. And then because you have that, you can license the technology to other. So I'm just wondering if you've explored any of those issues. 
Yes, I appreciate your comments about the fact that, yeah, it needs to have a marketing campaign so that people understand this is the issue. Of course, a lot of people don't know about that 30%. Yeah. That's the whole point, and that's part of the reason why I'm here today. Now, as far as investigating other regulatory agencies and things like that, other condom companies have been approached, some of the larger ones uh, that I mentioned, and they have such a niche in the market that they're really unwilling to take an honest look unless you turn over everything, okay? So, and also, I have something that they don't. I have worldwide patents and I have an FDA approved product. Well, I know, but I, so, what I'm saying is that they could, if, if the government said, hey, you have to employ some something here, and then you could license it to them, that's what I would Yeah, that's, that's a great idea, and I think it's a little bit more complicated than a person would initially imagine. We're, we're, we're in the process of trying that, and I think that's a great I idea to keep focusing on. Thank you. Sir, you had a question. Yes, I did. Uh, uh, early on, you, your chart said you needed help in marketing and, and investors. So I'm going to ask you the typical investor questions. You, you took us through all about condoms, so you never told us what your business model is. Could you tell us what is your business model? How do you make money at this? Okay, sure. There are several ways you make money in the condom business and especially introducing no, no, a new product. I'm not looking for a theoretical answer. I'm, I'm trying to understand how you're gonna make money at this. Yes, okay. I would like to make money on this by going to retail distributors, uh, getting in the stores, and uh, selling to worldwide to different kinds, types of condom venues. For example, there are several large manufacturers in Europe and if I can get a contract with those large manufacturers in Europe, they sell Trojan, Durex, Lifestyles, Ramsey, all these different types of condoms, and if mine could be one of those condoms where they sell hundreds of billions of condoms in Europe a year, then that would be a strategy to, to make money. Obviously, um, that's easier said than done, but that, that's part of the goal. And uh, when you do these, these things in foreign countries, part of the challenge is that I've experienced is receiving uh, health clearance. FDA approval is FDA approval, but if you go to India, for example, they say, great, you have FDA approval, so it'll work, but you need to go through a six to nine month process here to get a certificate to allow us to legally sell in India. And what happens is that process is expensive. So I'm trying to be as strategic as I can with the money I have with the business so far uh, to, to try to reach out in the right way strategically to get the people where I can get enough income and then to spread to countries like India, uh, India or Germany, for example, or France. Does that touch on your question? Okay. Okay. Well, it's, it's very complicated because as your friend said, uh, trying to make a deal with a big manufacturer is very difficult. And uh, a lot of people want a lot of money up front to, to or, or for me to give away patent rights or, and all that kind of thing. I had, I've had several people approach me, one individual, he wanted 20, 22% of any deal he would make with a European manufacturer. Well, of course, that doesn't work in business to ask for maybe a quarter, of, you know, 25% of all profits uh, right, right off the bat. So part of that challenge in the business model is regulating and leveraging that whole, that whole situation. Yes. Hi, Bill. Good morning. Good morning, One Million Cups. A couple questions for you, sir. First of all, thank you for taking the time to come out here and presenting for us. Thanks for allowing me to come. Glad that you have the time for yourself, because that way we can help you out here. My questions are, number one, where are you? Number two, what do you need? And number three, how can we as a community help you? Where am I? Yes, sir. I'm in Raleigh. Where I'm on... <laughs> Smile. I where is your company as far as distribution, marketing, advertising, website, podcasting, going to publications, knowing your target marketing, starting out with the micro market and then going into the macro scale, things along those lines? Right, you have my, you have my website. Uh, I'm a registered company, LLC in the state of Delaware. Smart. And, well, you've got to be financially prudent to, yes, to, to write business. Right. And uh, as far as podcasts, other things, I've held off because of the lack of the help I've been able to get so far, and the limited finances I've had as a startup entrepreneur to, to spread myself out there. I've had different offers, again, but a lot of times if someone wants to put you out, maybe be in social media or to, to make a big deal with a European manufacturer, they want a lot of money up front, and that's what I don't have right now to do that. But at the same time, even if I did have that kind of money, I would make sure that I'm spending the money wisely, obviously, right? So uh, that, 
And then your second part, your second question was? How can we help? Well, you can help by spreading the word that you understand this 30%, which a lot of people obviously don't. And obviously I'd like to know if anybody here has anybody who would like to join the team and or help specifically with uh, targeted investment money, monies. I have, and we can talk about that privately uh, at, the table, at the table afterwards, I have a list of specific monies I need and where I would like to invest. For example, I won't give you a number, but I have a study that you can, I can show you. It's, um, it is made by the Indiana University Sexual Health Institute, and it's a study that would prove that my condom is a safer condom. It would take a regular condom, my condom, O-ring condom, and a condom that was completely fluorescent. And it would test those in different control groups and different parties. And it would show then that, hey, it's not the fluorescence, and it's not the fact that it's right, it's my idea that's making somebody put that condom on correctly 100% of the time. And that would scientifically prove, I mean, obviously it's logically, intuitively correct, that hey, I got this, you just, you know, look at the ring and put it on and you're done. That means you're gonna put it on 100% of the time. Well, people are, yeah, but people who invest money, usually they want scientific proof. And they have a written study, 10, 12 pages long, uh, very thorough through the Kinsey Institute that I can show some more where I'd ask for a specific amount of money for. And what that study would do, would it, it would enable me to go to the FDA and say, hey, the Sexual Kinsey Health Institute has done this study and they have proven that my condom indeed is put on correctly X percent of the time as I clean. I would like the permission to put on the outside of the condom box a safer condom. Now, if I get to that point, if I can put on the box a safer condom and it is approved by FDA, you know, a lot of people get mixed with, you know, the food industry and the, the vitamin industry. They have so many gimmicks that can confuse people. That's, that's part of the scam. But if I can prove it through the US FDA, then it's a different ballgame. Then suddenly maybe people will start to listen. I mean, when I got it, there were a lot, hey, that's a great idea. And then I got the patents, and wow, that's really cool. And do you have a, do you have a prototype? Well, yeah, I got a prototype right here. Well, do you have FDA approval? Well, we're working on that. Yeah, we've heard that before, and I'm sure a lot of people have. Well, three years later, I did get the FDA approval, okay? So that's the step-by-step -step strategy. And then also about the money. Uh, hey, if I had had $500,000 four or five years ago to, to do with this product, uh, I may or may not have made the right decisions. I waited until I got FDA approval, and that was a smart thing to do. So it's all gotta be strategic, and I appreciate the gentleman in the back who said, hey, hey sir, what's your business model? Well, it's changed over time as a result of finances, as a result of the regulatory issues and the different challenges I've faced. Does that answer question number two? Okay, how about question number three, and then we'll move on. How yeah. can we help? Sorry? How can we help, aside from investment? Well, as I mentioned, I think earlier, what you can do is spread the word that, hey, you know, this guy is saying that 30% of the time condoms are put on incorrectly, and that causes an increase, you know, the, the venereal disease and unintended pregnancies. And what I'd like is people to start to understand that, hey, this is a documented fact. And as the gentleman in the light blue said, hey, yeah, a lot of people don't know that, and that is the point. That's part of the reason why I'm here today. Say, hey, did you know? And, you know, if more people knew, they would probably take the risk and say, hey, I'm, I'm gonna give this, I'm gonna give this condom a try. You know, now it's a little bit more difficult because it's not, it's not a new type of coffee cup or a coffee machine where, hey, yeah, it's cool, it makes coffee quicker, something like that. It's a medical product, and among the medical products, it's a condom. So if you have a gentleman who's been using Trojans for 25 years, he doesn't care. He's, he, he thinks he's seen it all, okay? So I would like your help to expand the, expand the, the wealth here. Work. Right back here. Yes, back sir. Here. Wait, wait, hang on. Hold on. So, so right back Bill, here. How much market research have you done so that you can take a look at the demographics just for the U.S. market alone? Who are the users as teenagers, as 20 somethings, as 30 somethings, and 40 somethings? Who makes the buying decision? Uh, that okay. Kind of thing. Very good question. We first started out from a worldwide view before we got the FDA approval. And 15 to 20 some year olds are the buyers in general who buy the most condoms. Those in their late 20s and 30s are that second tier. And this uh, does not include married couples among that. And then over 40, it obviously drops. So the women usually buy the more condoms 
in the 20s range. In the teenage range, it's the, it's, it's the men. And the market markets that where you could potentially buy are you know, a Walmart, a CVS. You can even have a vending machine, a condom kind of vending machine. Also, you can have these government organizations, uh, Planned Parenthood, or uh, other, other clinics uh, where you can uh, pass out this condom. Of course, when you start talking about these, these markets, Terry, you, you have to, as a businessman, make sure that you are gonna go into a market that produces enough profit, profit to keep you alive. And some of, these, some of these markets, for example, the vending machine market, if you go to an institution or a clinic, uh, like Planned Parenthood or something like that, uh, those profits are very low, believe it or not. And so initially, you have to decide, hey, am I trying to spread the word or am I, am I trying, to, trying to make money? I'm trying to do both. So, Terry, in answer to your question, the market is segmented mainly in the U.S., 15 to early 20s, and then after that, 20 to 40 with those buyers. Yes, sir. Wait, wait, we got a mic right over here. Oh. Yes. So uh, back to the, the statistic that you're hanging your hat on for this entire business model, this 30%. Yes, sir. What does that really translate to in meaning? Meaning, let me, let me tell you what exactly. Is, what is the fear that you're actually selling against here? You know, out of that 30% of, uh, we'll call them flipped, you know, flipped applications, how many times does that result in an STD or an unwanted pregnancy? Okay, the answer to that question is, there, there's no simple answer to the way you ask it. Let me break it down and make it simple. Okay, so, and again, these studies are all on, the, the one part of the study I showed was on the slide, but if you look on my website, you'll see that study and, and several different studies that, that show this has been a big problem for a long time. But that 30%, um, you're, you're putting the condom on, you're flipping it, and of those people who flip it, the question is, if they have a venereal disease, and if there is enough pre-ejaculatory pre, uh, you know, semen on the tip, they're pa they have the potential to pass a venereal disease just like if you had unprotected sex. So, so that's, that's the answer to your question, right? Because it would be like you're not using a condom, essentially, if you, if you flip it over and you have enough pre-ejaculatory you know, uh, pre, pre semen on the tip uh, to pass the venereal disease or unintended pregnancies. Now, the research is a little bit stronger for the passing of the venereal disease as it is for unintended pregnancies, but we leave it both because both can happen. Do, do you understand? I don't agree, but I'm saying I think that you have to be selling what are you really guarding against at the end of the day? And that's what I'm trying because yeah. on my slideshow, I was trying to say, hey, you know, I've got something that will reduce sexually transmitted infections and reduce unintended pregnancies. And that's the big, that's the big key here. No, but in terms of an audience, oh. I, didn't, I didn't hear, I had to dig with two or three questions to get the answer to that. Okay. I think you've got to come out swinging with, here's what we're doing. Okay, I appreciate you want this to really- I appreciate your input very much. I think we have a question. Yes. Yes, so, sir. Uh, kind of a two-part question. Um, thank you for the introduction to the condom market. I didn't realize there were so many contract manufacturers out there. So it sounds like you're trying to build kind of a marketing and sales organization. And then the second, so my, my, my question is, is that correct? And the second part of the question is, let's say you achieve your goal and you get 0.1% of the condom market. How big of a company are you at that point? In order, at that point, I'm still a small fish in a big pond with regard to the common industry. But that's an initial goal, okay? And so once I get that initial goal and the buzzword's out that, hey, there's this O-ring condom out there, what is that? And people start to understand, oh yeah, I've had that problem too. And oh yeah, my, my friend says this, this does, does the job as they claim. And so it starts to pick up. And then it potentially, you know, if any luck has it and the strategy business-wise is there, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a brand name. You know, and then it becomes, uh, you know, one of those 11% other brands besides the big three, and then suddenly, um, you know, potentially more could happen. Does that make you a $1 million company or a $10 million company or a $100 million? Depends on the time frame. If, if I have 0.1% of the market, I'll be a 10 million, 0.1% of the worldwide market, I'll be a $10 million company easily. Okay. See, if there are 15 billions caught and sold, 0.1%, what, 150 million? 
Yeah. So, you know, I sell that many condoms and, uh, you know, I obviously have to make a premium and, and uh, you know, profit and, and you can imagine the profit at that point. But again, th there, there are three different target, you know, goals here. It's the safety and efficacy, a, a new way to decrease STIs and viral diseases. I'm a businessman, I'd like to make profit, but uh, this is something that can, you know, reduce the spread of disease worldwide and help populations, whole populations. And remember, we have a lot of those third world countries that don't have this kind of option. Question? No, right in the middle. So in line, in line with your comment about whole populations in the third world, have you teamed up with any organizations like PEPFAR or any of the other uh, nonprofits that are trying to reduce the spread of HIV, AIDS, uh, and other infectious diseases worldwide and get their uh, buy-in uh, because that's an audience that it seems like you wouldn't really have to tell the story that you're telling to this group. They would get it right away and they would be able to say right away, yeah, that makes sense and we support you and, and right away you've got, call it a underwriter's laboratories seal of approval on what it is you're trying to do. And, and that's a great point. And the issue with that is that we are, in the end, um, we're making minimal, minimal profit with organizations like that. And I'm a business, so I can and will go to those organizations at the right time. As I mentioned over here, it's a stage process. First, patents, then FDA, then marketing, then financing, then targeting the right spots to go to, to make the business model successful. Yes, sir. Yes, hi. Um, interesting discussion here. Um, have you thought about just selling, the, the, now that you have these nice patents, you have that under your belt, um, you're looking to start a whole new company to do this. Instead of that, have you thought of selling your patents to you know, Trojan or some, someone else that might be able to use it and get it to the marketplace? Because one thing is, is getting this, this excellent product out. Another thing is getting a distribution uh, you know, to every CVS and Rite Aid, et cetera. That's not gonna be an easy thing to do. I, I agree 100%, and that is where the issue is, getting it. For example, if you go to CVS, as I understand the market, you know, you pay a shelf fee. Well, if you're not selling enough cottage, then, you know, you're, you're digging a grave, right? And as you say, go to Trojan, go to Durex, go to Lifestyles, you know, one of those. Yes. The issue with those companies is that they're not willing to pay a lot of money for a product to buy you out, okay? So that's the main problem. And I'm gonna say problem because we've investigated that and whether they like the product or not, and whether they have a whole room of teams saying, yeah, we want your product, uh, they're only willing to wager so much. To, to do that. It could be a combination of a down payment and also a percentage of what they might think. That's true, a percentage of royalties. And to make those royalties agreements, uh, a lot of legal fees, and it's gonna cost you a lot of money, and in the end, they're not gonna, there the, are the three, as I understand it, the three ways to make that agreement. There's a, there's a lump sum initially to make the agreement. Then there's a agreed upon time frame with a royalty fee. And then there's agreed upon royalty for a minimum amount. So in other words, if I made a deal with Durex, for example, they'd pay me, you know, whatever, 50,000 to make the agreement and then say, okay, Bill, we're gonna give you a cent a condom and then we're gonna make sure that number three is, if you don't sell 100,000 condoms for a year, we're gonna make sure that at least you get 100,000 times a cent per year. And they would go for a five year or to a buyout lifetime. Those are very complicated to do. That's a great question, and we will continue to consider that as an option. Yes? Do you have any sales or marketing people right now? I have two gentlemen in Florida, and I have one in Los Angeles. Okay. What are they working on currently? They are working on the same thing I'm preaching about today, sales and, and finding the right venues. We had a company in Los Angeles that has a, a website, a dating website, okay, for example. So what they wanted was, uh, they have a dating website where you, you can put up your sexually transmitted infection status, okay? So I have X disease or I do not have X disease. And they have, you know, they go through a laboratory and they put it, it's all verified, you know? And they wanted to use my condom potentially to, to sales for that. Well, you know, they, they, we, we pitched it and they never came back. So we, we tried with a few of these venues and uh, the word's got to get out that it's it's really necessary, as this gentleman over here said, you know, 30% really needs to be emphasized so that people understand, hey, this is a product that people really need. Over, the mic is over. Okay. okay. Good. Um, part of what I'm noticing is that the 
this, I've noticed this with like tons of tech, technical people like yourself that can create products and everything very focused on the details, which is incredibly important. However, that doesn't sell. Um, I understand. I, that's, I'm a salesperson. I work with a lot of technology people, and I couldn't do my job without them. But I think have, you just need to get this out to the market and stop thinking so much about the details and just get it out there and more of an emotional pitch than 30%. Like a, a number doesn't, is, even though we like to think that we think logically, people don't. Like it's an emotional buy no matter what. Okay. People are going to be, you need to bring some emotion into that. Uh, and I think that's what someone over here is getting at, but there has to be some sort of a story or some sort of a quick emotional reaction that you're getting from people, and 30% is not gonna do that. Okay, okay I, that's a great idea. That's something I really haven't heard. I think we had somebody over here. Yes, so sir. what is the research around, I understand the Trojan brand is ingrained in men, Okay. But what, do, do women have the same attachment to the brand do they even, is that something they're even aware of? And second, I would think this would be a good idea for, and I think there is one in my short research while you're here, is there a sex, sex industry accelerator that would take care of all the stuff that you're struggling with, whether, whether that's the, the funding or the industry relationships? There has to be a sex industry accelerator for startups Right. That would take a slice of equity to handle all the stuff that you're struggling with. Yeah. Right. Answer to your question number one: Yes, women have the same kind of, of attachment as I understand the, the industry. Number two: Yes, Adam and Eve or one of these sex stores, we could put them all out there over the U.S. That's not why I came into this business. I didn't come into this business to sell something in a sex shop. It's obviously a market that I could tap into. But I want to make it clear to my consumer, this is a new medical product. This solves a well-documented problem with condoms. Do you understand what an accelerator is? Uh, I guess I did not. I apologize. It's a, it's a, it's a place that has like a FinTech accelerator they would have in Charlotte. Of how do you sell technology to banks? Okay. This would be a facility and an organization that's well-funded that invests in companies in a specific industry, like Cindy Whitehead here has a business called the Incubator. It's an accelerator for startups that are for and about women, and they she only focuses on that. And she invests, let's say, fifty to two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and she gets a piece of the company. But she is not Adam and Eve. She is a a startup okay. organization that's funded that invests in industry products. That, that's a great idea, and, and uh, that's something that I obviously should look more into. Thanks for that option. And when I do that kind of option, I want someone to stick with me. The issue I've had is I've reached out to other venues, not this particular one, which was a great idea, and they've, they, they've shown initial interest, and then they haven't been followed through. But that's a great idea, and I appreciate the input. Thank you so much. Right back over here. We have a question back here somewhere. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, yeah, just a thought. Have you thought about uh, cancer treatment, particularly in oncology? Because the uh, particularly, say, breast cancer detection rates, they're detecting more and more people, younger and younger and younger, okay? That generally involves um, a round of chemotherapy. During this round, sometimes you've hit uh, a family at a, at a stage where nobody's expecting it, they're very emotional, and now you have uh, this big risk of birth defects. So now your oncologist has to discuss with a couple what to do about they're now possibly dangerous sexual activity. And condoms is one of the generally described things in that. So that would be a whole new market. You've got teaching hospitals all around you here, big ones. They will get it right away. They have to deal with this problem every single day. And that could be a big boost just to, uh, to make an entrance there and also get their names behind. That's a great idea. That's something I didn't think of. Well, I appreciate the input. That's awesome. Yes, sir, we have a question? Okay, okay. If there are no other questions, I appreciate it. Yes, we have a question? Okay, here we go. Hi, uh, I'm a trademark lawyer, and it looks like, if I understand correctly, you had a little bit of history on your way to getting a registration. Yes, sir. I, I wonder if you could just, would be comfortable saying a little bit about that experience, maybe? Sure, 
Sure, I'd be more than happy. Getting a trademark is for life. And getting a trademark, one of the requirements is that they have different requirements, and one of them is that it can't have a name in that resembles the actual product function or design. So the problem I had was that I called this O-ring condom, and of course it has a ring on the bottom of the condom, and the trademark attorney said, hey, nope, it shows that O-ring is the thing you're selling, and that doesn't work in trademark law. And that's what we had to fight against. And so what we did was we appealed it, and then we, we appealed it again. And after you appeal a couple times, instead of it being a patent office uh, engineer, then you go to an actual appeal process where it turns into attorneys, trademark attorneys, and then they look at it from a legal perspective. And at that point, we got the easy, we got the easy trademark on it. So in other words, if you see things like the Coca-Cola bottle, and if you see someone advertise uh, you know, you know, they had in the 80s, you know, they had something written that it looked like if it, if it was the same font as the Coca-Cola, but it didn't say Coca-Cola. You know, that, that could be perceived as that Coca-Cola object, you know, and that was one of the problems. Or the bottle by itself, that by itself, hey, that's a Coca-Cola trademark, uh, a bottle, so you can't use that type of bottle because Coca-Cola, that, that was more common law than anything else. But in, in my case, that was the main issue. So trademarks got to be unique. And it's got to be, uh, got to be, uh, it's pretty thorough. And the trademark was not easy. And let me tell you, the patents were not easy either. We had somebody from 1954 show up on a patent website and uh, they said no, and then they said yes, and then they said yes, but we have some others and they kept, uh, but we finally got it. We should have gotten it and they should have passed it the first time. But a lot of times the patent office uh, depends on if, Seriously, it depends on uh, the funding for the patent office, and that's political. It also depends on what kind of examiner, uh, you know, how much of experience they've had, and who the supervisor is. And that was the case when I had the patents. And I had three utility patents in the United States, and then the other ones I have overseas are design patents. And the utility patents, the key is it's a, it's a new process, not just a new design. Does that answer your question? Would you like to add anything? Well, you know, we got we got started on the trademark, and if I had my way, I had 10 or 12 names for this. And uh, you can only debate so long, like when you're taking a test, you know, you get down, you can only go so long. And we chose it and we went with it. It's obviously not the best, but I think it's pretty darn good. Yeah. And we could have gotten some other trademarks, but you don't know where that road leads, and uh, we don't want to look back in a business. All right, perfect. Well, that's, that's about our time, William. Thank you very much Thanks for so joining much. us today. Appreciate it. If you have any questions or you'd like some samples, I'm over at the table for 10 or 15 minutes.